the night he came home. This is Illiterate. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. This week, we are covering Halloween. My name is Evan. I just revisited David Gordon Green's two films leading up to Halloween Ends this week. I'm hanging with my buddy, Taylor. How are you, Taylor? I am well. I read a bunch of old interviews from the 70s. <laughs> Halloween Ends, the third chapter in David Gordon Green's Halloween trilogy, will be out as of this episode. Uh, I feel like so... there should be a question mark after that title, because <laughs> Ends? based on what we're going to talk about, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm really excited. It's a Halloween day for me. I get to record the show later tonight. I'm going to see the film. I'm ready. I'm ready for it And Evan it loves end. this. Yeah, he uh, you loves know, this. Uh, <laughs> yes. Right off the top. I have... <sighs> You're outing me. Uh, I, I am a huge Halloween fan. It's probably my favorite, one of my favorite properties. Um, I, I've I've been loving this uh, franchise for as long as I can remember. Yeah, so I, I'm stoked. And I'm stoked because, honestly, this is a series of movies that has a lot of movies that aren't that great in it. <laughs> I'm a re I'm I'm also a Halloween elitist. Uh there I like to think about different <laughs> ways to ad address the whole series. How well, 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 if I want to entertain this idea of the story. Hmm, I'll, yeah. Let me pull on that thread and I'll watch in this order. Ooh. Well cuz what I Evan is getting feeling. at, yeah. I looked into <laughs> some stuff and I'm a moron. I don't think maybe I saw the first one. Or, or clips of it or something, but I it's not my forte, but I found that there is a ton of rebooting and changing, and then some Unending. lines of the storyline get used, and then it's like, well, now let's start here on this one and try a branching thing, and now let's not have anything to do with anything, so I'll post a link. There's a great infographic explaining the different timelines and which film's offshoot of which, and which ones are just way off in the corner, and which ones are technically in line chronologically but a reimagining it's just very a dear friend put that on a shirt for me oh really <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes uh i i wear it with pride i'll probably wear it tonight than a movie um yeah yeah so it's, that's part it's of a, the, the choose fandom. your own adventure movie series truly and it's honestly given me a lot of uh a lot of insight uh and template to look to as people have gotten acquainted with like multiverse and reboots and remakes and doing it yeah. again. You know, this I'm, I've kind of been down this road, man. We've, I've, <laughs> we have done this. We have, Jamie Lee has been back three times. You know, like, well, that's we why have, it's so funny. The end thing. It's like, exactly. And then I think why? it's so smart for them to do that because you're putting, you're going to put butts in the, in seats just on, just because, okay, this it's supposed to be the last one. It literally says that's what it says ends. So, I love the the kind of mm -hmm. pull there for the marketing because you know, yeah, not for one second am I thinking that this is the last Halloween movie I'm ever yeah. going to see. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> and if you've been listening at all, uh, especially in the last year since Halloween Kills came out, because I've been thinking about this a lot since Halloween Kills came out, um, I've been mentioning on the podcast a lot about this series, and in particular, I've mentioned Mustafa Akkad a couple times, even in recent uh, episodes. Uh -huh. And so he's one of the main figure points that we're going to address today to trying to give people an idea why this series looks the way it does when you put it on a shirt. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it starts with him in 76 was his directorial debut. The film that he did then was called The Message or Muhammad Messenger of God. Hmm. And it's Lord. about Muhammad. And he had gone through the Hollywood system. He went to school at UCLA. And so he's an interesting guy in that it seems that he's making really commercial stuff and then making really passion projecty stuff as it's called now mm -hmm. and and using the oscillation between the two to get the other one done and so right. even with this though it's such a controversial thing had a lot of difficulty getting support from the muslim majority countries king hassan the second of morocco said sure do it here hmm. but even then that was not enough and the saudi government gave him a lot of bad pressure and so then nobody's in but controversial figure, leader, dictator, 40 years in power, Gaddafi yes. of Libya, let Lord. him finish it. And then that comes into the lore of like, well, he got money from him and now he's a financier. And then later on did the money from that 
<laughs> go Did to fund Gaddafi Halloween. finance yeah, yeah. Halloween. Yeah, that's always a a point. If you well, if you, from yeah. from my understanding, that movie they were making, you know, is on Lawrence of Arabia scale. Uh, yes, know, production, yeah, it was, and they're yeah. spending three hundred thousand dollars a day. <laughs> something to that effect, which that's the entire entire budget for something like Halloween. So uh, it's funny it, getting a more of a, con- a concept of what he was doing the big thing and then the little I'll do one for them, mm-hmm. one for me. That's that's very interesting. And then starts to make sense of why we need a concept that takes place over the course of one night. What's something that just if we don't need a lot of props and a lot of a lot of big sets. What, what can we do? That's where it starts. <laughs> very much so. Yeah. So like you said, with the small and the big, it's like, I was puzzled. He's got all these Halloween properties, but the, the message was nominated for an Oscar for score oh, that wow. year. Lost oh, of course to star Wars. Good. Yeah. Oh, well, but how could you win? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it was up there and it was big, but, but this is the, it's, it's not just like, Oh, he made these random things. No, he's in well Lib- known. In Libya. Yeah, 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 exactly. So he's big Hollywood financier, producer. That's um, good because I've I've never really had much of a context for him before uh, the talks Halloween. for Halloween get together. Right. I know that he's doing this giant Lord of the, you know Lawrence of Arabia style production, but I didn't I didn't really know what his tone was going the in the going back and forth a big one a little one one for them one for me type of thing is really <laughs> interesting and hearing that hearing that his last film before halloween was nominated for an oscar at all is like yeah wow okay. yeah, yeah. this definitely puts him <laughs> this definitely puts him in a little bit of a different folder or file cabinet in my mind as terms of what because and we'll get into the story here but halloween turns into what halloween's franchise turns into and this guy just has a grip over this <laughs> <laughs> right um, yeah and so you know i just i think of him as you know he's just turning out these horror movies and do oh that's and we'll do that and we'll get into all that but like i'm not thinking about his status as a filmmaker pre-1978 that's really uh that's really uh, fascinating yeah. So from that, it's not just him. It's this guy, Irwin, who is more the producer, has the idea, wants to do something with the same punch as The Exorcist, met John Carpenter, seeing his previous work at a film festival. This is the squad that's going to produce this. And like I said, Mustafa put up the 300,000. They want to do this psychotic babysitter killer film. Right. Right. With this guy who has done one movie, John Carpenter, and Deborah Hill, who's co-writing. Yeah, um, Deborah is actually uh, uh, coming up through production at this point, and this is going to be her first movie producing. Um, right. And it's a huge thing, also in 1978, to have a woman producer. That's a big deal. Um, and so it's John coming into. He just did a pre, uh, Assault on Precinct 13, and he's looking for directing work. He's not got the concept or the script or anything. He is a he wants to be a director for hire. I want to make feature films. Here's what I can do. Let's meet and talk. So this is really just a, a, an, a project that comes across his desk. And him and Deborah Hill are in the middle of a romantic relationship and a creative relationship blossoms out of it. And so they partner up, team up. We're going to do this together. I'll write with you. You produce it. I'll direct it. We got a movie on our hands. That sounds that's that sounds that, that's awesome. That's you know, yeah. um, but that that's how they went about it. And in, and from what I know, they they wrote that script incredibly fast. Uh, Deborah Hill and John Carpenter wrote the yeah. the Halloween script in something like a month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And and like you said, with all of the new energy brought into this project, mixed with the financiering of some more, I guess, <laughs> capable hands, mm. there is a let's just get it done and put it together. The mask was $2 and was William <laughs> Shatner's face. Uh, it's just, this is a group of people who are hungry. This is a group of yeah, people yeah, exactly. who almost almost have no experience. John Carpenter has made a movie. Deborah Hill has worked in the production office. And a lot of these people who are now heading up these departments were on, uh, you know, they, they were friends on other productions and they liked each other's talent in those departments and decided to bring, okay, you can, I, I Tommy, I think you can production design this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's how it comes together. People forget this when we look at it after 45 years, 44 years, 
that this and 13 was not total films yeah right right exactly <laughs> and that, that this was nobody's passion baby project concept that they had been you know petting for years or knew just knew it was going to be incredible this is something that came together out of necessity this is something that came together out of sheer creativity and the opportunity. These people wanted a career. This is a full. Of, this is a team full of hungry, hungry people. Exactly. Um, and if it's given to you, it's like he was paid ten thousand dollars to write, direct, and do the music, which is around forty five thousand dollars today. Which, if you know anything about directing a feature film, <laughs> that's not that much. Yeah. So even it, even in that time, yeah. Exactly. So th this is a lot. These are people really trying to prove that they are where they belong. Speaking of, <laughs> I was interested to know in terms of the, the hungry efforts and just the legacy and influences, a lot of the stuff is personal that they're basing it off of and making it quick and easy to put together. Mm -hmm. And then, and then some of the earlier stuff that they're pulling from as well. The biggest one being four years before black Christmas, which was yeah. not regarded, but then is now, up there on the list because it is one yes. of the earliest slashers in this yes. vein. And it's also based on, which I th we've talked about somewhere, the trope of the babysitter call. Oh, it's from inside the house. This was exactly. this urban legend of the sixties and seventies. So, and also coincidentally of, yeah. enough, uh, set on a holiday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Christmas. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. It definitely has a lot there. I, they also remade that movie. I, I think 2019. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh dude, wow. Gosh. There's a very, um, really recent one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, just a fun little tidbit there. Cause you mentioned the holiday, Bob Clark, who directed that mm. also directed another Christmas movie, a Christmas story with Ralphie. Oh, and the, <laughs> it's the, the Americana one. Yeah. Wildly oh my different. god oh my god <laughs> so i did not know i did yeah. black christmas well, yeah he did and both. a christmas story <laughs> yeah 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 oh my gosh that's incredible that's actually new information for me i love that <laughs> um but yeah so the, the larger point here is like this has become the first one in particular has become such a, a lauded piece of cinema Mm -hmm. um, it's become poured over, analyzed, and for good reason. This, this is not a movie with nothing in it, but we're trying to make the point here that this was not anybody's baby. Yeah. Because it had to happen right now. Yeah. It has to happen right now. <laughs> what are you going to do? And Yeah. The stuff, they're, <laughs> the stuff they're pulling from, even like the, the stuff I found funny was the names are all just stuff that they already <laughs> had in field is where Deborah was raised. Bowling yes. Green is where John Carpenter was raised, which he had the made up name of the music because he just did it himself and then Deborah, Isn't that crazy I've, I've, yeah, yeah. I've never heard he, he just didn't want it to look like he was a one-man band which i really admire yeah. um so he credits the bowling green uh symphony orchestra which does not exist <laughs> right uh and then Deborah wrote the girl dialogue because she was a babysitter and she also knows suburbia in that way i, and I then mean on, yeah i got it on that note too really underrated element of what makes this whole thing work because we really get to sit with these girls these babysitters and hear them talk and they sound so real and they're interesting and we start to gain so you know with some feelings about what we oh they may mm, they, sh they shouldn't hang out with them you know that kind of thing yeah that's all from Deborah hill uh, and I think that's one of the distinct things missing in any other sequel, really, is the realness and the intimacy and the textured nature of just living in an everyday, you know, afternoon with these girls. Yeah, it is a tandem effort. Otherwise, I, you could I just love thinking yeah. about this writing uh, partnership, too. I mean, really, they, she gets to take the day babysitters, school boyfriends, you know, all that fun, normal stuff. John gets to take Dr. Loomis, the evil, the murders, the, the you know, the, the, the sequences of climax and the, all of the. And it, one without the other isn't enough. This screenplay was thrown together really fast. And it's become something, or it, be, it was shot into something that is lauded and, and analyzed. But I think we just railroad over it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and throw all the praise onto John Carpenter. Uh, when I think the 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 way that this script actually was written is directly responsible for how effective it is. Very, very, uh, and because of the necessity, we got to do this right now. Prove it. We got to do it. 
Well, yeah, I like what you're saying with the with the with the blending of it too. We had mentioned in an old episode just about Halloween, about Samhain, the Gaelic yes. Harvest Festival, Summer's End, which Deborah is the one who brings that flavor to the original thinking mm. about that. And it's like, who had even heard of that before? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So she's she's the primary source of that, where it's the, the liminal space and the souls come back and can wreak havoc on the living. And uh, yes. Yeah. You know, I'll put I'll put a link to the old episode where we talk about all the history of Halloween stuff as well. But uh, that was yeah, we did a wonderful episode jam. on just the holiday itself, not tied to any particular thing. So, yeah, uh, but please go back and listen to that. all the all the all the tropes of Halloween bobbing for apples and trick or treating and all that stuff has a purpose <laughs> at some point in history. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, what, that's what she was into. I yeah, think, sorry if, if that was what you were looking for for this episode. I'm so sorry, but we did, we did do we, that. We did another, do it. Yeah, it's, I'll put a link, but it's also probably called Halloween, so don't be confused. Yeah. Um, uh, the last the last little bit with the naming stuff and and pulling from influences together, I think, is – and it's why it got a bit of a mixed reception when it came out. Some people loved it. Some people said this is so derivative is uh, copying Psycho being the big one. And it casted uh, Psycho's star's daughter right, in the lead right. role. <laughs> Perhaps for some of the publicity. And then also the name Sam Loomis is yes. Marion's boyfriend in Psycho. So the naming as well, not just in real life, but also in fake life. There's <laughs> direct reference. Not yes. even a, just the full name also, which is fun. Yeah. We just took the name, the entire character name. <laughs> yeah. As well as in from Rear Window, Tommy Doyle is from that Hitchcock. Right. Film also. <laughs> I didn't realize that one. Yeah. Own it bashed. This is, you know, this is what we're inspired by. But they're and it's not like they're doing the same thing. They're taking they're taking a little aesthetic piece and attributing it onto something very new, <laughs> very mm-hmm. different, very fresh for the time. I like to think about what they're taking. I love you pulling out what they're what they take and what all of the kind of low hanging fruit. But this is the stuff that people just like forget about. Just like, well, you have to kind of inject things with yourself. Um, mm-hmm. What you know? Well, where are you from? What was your third grade teacher's name? You know, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> it's a real name. Not? It'll feel exactly, real. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Hide some homages in there. Yeah, but we don't. We don't. It's not about the homage, <laughs> right? Which the POV stuff was also in. Black Christmas, mm. the, the killer POV. I'll post a link to just some clips of where they use it and then was used in Friday the 13th later. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what it was both praised and critiqued for the camera, the music, the tension, obviously. But then you can probably speak to this more. The lack of blood and graphic violence was also interesting. In yeah, this people first forget one, that least. this is not a gory uh, movie. There's no, there's no blood in it. Almost. Um, <laughs> there's the, it's very, it's very dry. Um, yeah. It's and a lot happens off camera. A lot you discover, mm-hmm. and a lot of that's just because of budget. To be honest, right. That <laughs> takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of money. They don't have the resources to buy eight resets of clothing for Lori to get the gag mm-hmm. right. You know, like that. That's just not in. And that's heads not what being this lopped off, and exactly. Right. And 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 really not necessary for what they were trying to pull at, I, you know. They were, I think, Deborah Hill and John Carpenter in particular, when it came to like what the evil of this is, I think they were just trying to look into the the absence of a hu- of humanity, the absence right. of of a personality. Because yeah, because they were looking at the dangers of suburbia, which I think, from what I'd seen, had not really been explored in this way trying to yeah. shield kids from the city or whatever you know but but like you said well, this unspeakable have, evil yeah we have gotten very used to in the last you know two decades or so of you know violence just happening in in public at the movie theater in america and we're all in in america we are all kind of thinking about these things much much more than we than we used to back to 1978 because at this point we are less than 10 years outside of the nation's biggest and first school shooting which was the clock tower in in texas um Mm -hmm. and the idea of of random acts of violence penetrating suburbia was a shocking idea most of the reason that this thing really has a gripping power and i think that it's something that has gotten a little bit forgotten in terms of what 
the the horror of this that it's really speaking about but i don't think it's a mistake that this series has never gone away and honestly will not die and will be continued to be revived and restarted and redone is because we are not through with that type of violence in fact i think we're just discovering it right because what you're saying is like it was more fabulistic of a yes. fable quality of a yes. oh here's a boogeyman story for your kids but not set in yeah the idea Ger- that you Germany could just be in walking... the 1500s or whatever right yeah Right. The idea in, in 1969 that you could be walking to the drugstore and just picked off by a sniper rifle is, is unfathomable. It's insane. You can, that's the most shocking, <laughs> the most shocking right. thing you can think of. Uh, and you're left thinking, well, how could anybody be drawn? I mean, how could anybody do something like this? And we're still asking these questions as acts of public, public violence increase. I think the horror in Halloween inherent is pulling on those exact threads. Yeah, um, personally, I think um, this might be a little step far, but I, it, when I when I'm trying to think about what Halloween looks like in reality, these characters and these lessons, I think the Myers house, if you think about the Myers house broken down 15 years ago, uh, a family imploded because a, 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 a white son just went crazy. When I think about that and what that looks like born out in real life or those types of what Michael goes on to do, acts of violence in public, random people, uh, I think back to Columbine and I think about what Dylan Claybold's house would have looked like the night after Columbine happens. Mm -hmm. That's what the Myers house looks like to me. Uh, And I think that's why Michael Myers and the horror that this movie is tapping into is only becoming more and more pressing for us to understand, to be honest. Um, I, I don't think it's a mistake that these movies have continued to reinvent themselves because this horror <laughs> that it's pulling on has only grown and grown and grown. Scream is the big is a big uh, example for me, too. I think Scream is Halloween in a lot of ways remade. Scream is much more about the oh, you sure. know, on the surface talking about genre stuff and talking about movies. But if you want to boil it down to the horror of it and what's actually happening in the plot, it's a it's a huge remake of Halloween in so many ways. And it's very, again, very overt in, in doing that. Halloween is built into that movie. But it's talking about the very same things. And this is happening in 1994. This is happening just before Columbine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think when you look at a movie like Scream, it is the evolution of Halloween. It is Halloween remade on the precipice of something like Columbine happening. Yeah. And I think with the you're talking about like why it's progressing. I think some of the stuff with from what I could see with the original as well is the the slasher element of it, what it's known for. The knife stuff is very different from right. guns. Uh, right. And then with that, you know, which John Carpenter has denied or said, we were not thinking about that. Right. What is this sort of morality play about sex and women and violence against women and mm. knives penetrating and the, all of the <laughs> visual I, and yeah, thematic that, allegories of that? When I think about that, I feel like the knife, the knife killer, the slasher is the it's the artistic expression. It's the it's the stage version of a shooter, of somebody just trying to cause violence. The gun is the modern extension of like, it's just quicker, faster, you can accomplish the goal quick, whatever. Uh, but to boil that down into to explain something, if we're gonna make art out of it, if we're gonna get, get to the bottom of something, then the knife killer makes sense to me. It's operatic, it's theatrical. Uh, yeah. It's much more personal. It's much more, you have to get up and close. Uh, <laughs> that's Versus much different anonymous, than a gun. Random. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's that's where it for me it plays as just an in, it's a necessary theatrical uh, adaptation really of that violence. Yeah. Um, that's what I see in the knife. Uh, that's but it's kind that's of opera. interesting. <laughs> yeah. As we as we move off of the first one and what we're talking about, how it is more theatrical. I think you can speak to the development of the other ones and yeah. the necessity of developing characters but the original one having this fable like quality even though it is up close and personal it isn't personal because nobody right. is affiliated <laughs> you know <laughs> but then they say well we got to start tying some threads here together to keep people engaged or do it as an as an anthology right. and it's not which they also you know <laughs> they tried that yeah but, uh, so 
we got to think about the time uh, that this happens too. So the first movie comes out in 78. The second movie comes out in 81. On the turn of 1980, doing a sequel because something was successful is not necessarily where the business standards are. Uh-huh. So they have to make a decision. Are we going to, okay, uh, so do we, do we, how do we capitalize on this? Do we do more of this night, more of these characters, or do we turn this into something very different? The powers that be say, we got to keep this capital and this momentum. We're doing a direct sequel to the dismay of Deborah Hill, John Carpenter, and basically all of the real talent involved. John Carpenter is contractually uh, obligated to write the script, declines directing it. Uh, I think Jamie Lee comes back because it's a good opportunity, but I don't think anybody is really excited that, oh, yeah, we're going to, uh, the idea is we're going to do literally more of the night. He came <laughs> home. It's a direct follow up. We're following yeah. Jamie Lee's character all the way to the hospital. We're in the hospital, the duration of the film. Uh, and it's more of that night and it's fun if you just god if you just love halloween it's like a little extra comic book and you just get to live in that night for like i mean so it's it's it feels yeah. like that same night it's fun but it's a very different tonally movie it's much more gory it's much more in your face that's one of the things that i think the knee-jerk reaction this has got to be different that they just veered off course now it's a gross out film very fast and that becomes basically the tone for these movies henceforth and it's a big <laughs> mistake i think this uh, immediately this series gets in hot trouble immediately <laughs> uh, yeah. when they try to make this sequel uh and that is where the um brother sister element comes in that's the only piece of story he can pull out of this okay so what if what is it about this girl these these, these right. characters are going to wind up together at the end of the movie. What story is there to pull out here? And regretfully, and John Carpenter will say as much that he, that we'll have, I'll make him her brother. <laughs> and he, he right. Well, that's like I'm, what I'm saying with decision. the, with the personal element, you lose some of that. Oh, yeah. well, this could happen to anyone. It's like, exactly. no, because I don't have a you, brother. <laughs> right. Exactly. Whatever. You start to demystify everything I said about where the first film leaves you starts to get undone. If you start to explain away who and why Michael, why Lori, that's why the, <laughs> most of these movies start to go off a cliff. But it is what it is. And it's supposed to be over there. Yay. I accept they're going to make more. Uh, except how do you make more? He's in flames <laughs> and Dr. Loomis is dead and good God, what more is there to pull out of it? This is where the idea of the anthology comes back in. Yeah. Uh, Cause the third I, one has nothing to do. This is, if you're looking at the flow chart, it's just off on the side <laughs> and it's own little He's world. an Island. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, I, I, I personally feel really bad for this movie because it gets a really, really bad rap. Because it doesn't have Michael Myers in it, and it's not part of the Halloween Halloween franchise at all. The thought being too late is that Halloween could be like Twilight Zone. Halloween could yep. be a night of anything could happen, and these will be Halloween tales. What happens on Halloween night, which I actually freaking <laughs> adore, man. <laughs> it's kind of like really, Predator, which we yes, did, where it's like, yeah, yes. put it in a different thing each one but there's yeah, yeah. you know it not michael myers is just in that one it's a new thing a new halloween night a new thing who knows how audiences would have responded to that third film if it was actually the second film mm -hmm. but i think it would have been in a much better pos uh, position to make that leap instead of the the problem here is they followed up more of the night he came home well now yeah. if i go into a third movie i'm expecting more of him in the day, he's getting now, groceries. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, I'm, you know, I'm telling you, where's Michael Myers? And yeah. you can't blame an audience for that. <laughs> and so three comes out and it confuses everyone, does not right. do that well. And we don't get another Halloween film for six years, uh, all the way up until 1988. 1988. Uh -huh. Four Halloween four. It's it's crazy. Halloween four, the return of Michael Myers. So Michael Myers is back in it, and so we hit a stretch of movies here that tried to carry continuity. They do a terrible job, um, but they are supposed to be connected all three together. Four, five, and six you can watch in a row, and it's a lot of fun. But a lot of things are uneven and don't make sense and and don't match up. Or really, it's it's a kind of a you know it's eighties horror at its best. <laughs> When everybody else um, is doing it too, also. So four and five get made on top of each other. Uh, four gets a lot of energy put into it, a lot of money. Five gets kind of 
pigeonholed at the end of it with almost no budget and no time, and it's a complete mess. And then there's a little bit more of a lull uh, for Six. Six is uh, uh, in the mid-90s, but it's still supposed to be connected. Doesn't gain any traction at all. (laughs) The franchise is really in in a state of limbo, and they don't know which way to go. The Really, at the end of Six, the continuity in the story is so a mess. Now we're now we're putting now Michael is controlled by a cult, the cult of <laughs> Thorn, and there are men in the shadows that are telling him what to do, and there's a reason behind everything, and it's just outrageous, and nobody wants to figure out why. <laughs> yeah, um, and so but this Mustafa's is where, behind. Yeah, Mustafa's yes. behind it all. Uh, Mustafa is the man that pumps these three movies through. Uh, it feels like when you watch these three movies that they're made by totally different like people, but it I, at the top of it, it's all the same people. So I, I'm, <laughs> it's pretty incredible. In, in my studies, all I can point to is they were chasing industry trends at the time, and that was right. really it. They were just trying to chase the quick dollar at the industry trend. What was happening? What can we jump on? What can we do? How fast can we do it? So they make it four and five so fast that they almost burn out and they do six and it still doesn't gain traction. Nobody knows where to take the story. So we're almost demanding at this point from anybody's perspective that it be rebooted, restarted. We have to straighten up and clean up this continuity. We have to have a new pass at this. And so Halloween H20 comes out in 1998 and it is the first one with Jamie Lee Curtis in it again since 1981. Uh-huh. Um, so it's supposed to be 20 years later. It's following the Strode character who is living under uh, an assumed name uh, in the witness protection uh, agency. <laughs> She's This is the only one that doesn't take place in Haddonfield, which I actually really love it for that. It takes place in California. Yeah. And this is the first one where we get that choose your own, you know, if you want to kick out three. Go off three to another thing. Yeah. But this is a choose your own adventure one. This is a direct sequel to Halloween 2. Skip 4, 5, and 6. They they <laughs> they brush it in there as, well, you know, maybe that happened, but maybe not. You know, it's it's like yeah. mitigated down to the title sequence and they acknowledge that maybe some of those things happened, but also no. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so this is when I'm I'm starting to get and you know, this is 1998 and I'm starting to realize, okay, so we can just start over. We can just go yeah. back and do a sequel to that movie and people are only now getting acquainted with that idea kind of in the last maybe 10 years that you can just do an erroneous sequel to some other movie (laughs) and and just clean slate everything in between we've been doing this a while (laughs) yeah bizarre that you put the number 20 in there in the title (laughs) because it's just it makes it even more confusing i get that it's the date and it's been 20 years since the original that to me again i'm glad you brought that up because that is exactly an that is an industry trend at the time. For whatever reason, there's a oh. huge trend in the 90s where these titles got shortened to acronyms. Yeah, That's just Eight. how it happened. Yeah. And so because they wanted, they were following industry trends and they want to be the hottest thing and they want to be the coolest thing, they want to fit right in with the coolest people in the crowd and go to all the Hollywood parties. H2O, baby. Halloween yeah. water. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the spa. It's insane. So, it, you know, if to to make a point off of that, this is also the only one that I, I think has a licensed song. Um, oh, I think yeah. Creed has. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, this, Creed yeah. actually has a licensed song that plays all over the credits. And I want to throw up every time. <laughs> uh, it's incredible, actually. It's so funny. Uh, and even the lyrics of the song are so funny because it's like, what is this laugh for? While he's like <laughs> slitting throats in the. <laughs> yeah. This is um, also, I, I want to talk about Mustafa his, yes. because he, we popped in with him, but he's up until eight, which is the next one yes they pop out so, a, uh, they do that again if you see yeah. Mustafa style they get it they wait a little while then they do a great one and then he tries to capitalize on it immediately and kills yeah. it and it happens three times in this so series. that's that's halloween resurrection but his son is sl- one of his sons is slowly working his way in malik was a pa on four associate producer on six and then water and then <laughs> co-producer on resurrection which comes after Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And so that's that's where we're at now, where we've got eight under Mustafa, but his son, one of his sons is rising up in the world. That's where we mentioned a few weeks yeah. ago about Hollywood nepotism. I brought up the the Akkads for that exact yeah yeah purpose uh, because it's from this point on. Resurrection, the eighth film, comes out in two thousand and two, 
And unfortunately, Mustafa Akkad fell victim to a terrorist attack in yeah. 2005 and passed away. His son very much so took over. Uh, and it didn't take very long there and after to completely restart. This is how you get the Rob Zombie remake in 2007. And from here on out, it's a little bit of a different tone. We're not, <laughs> we're not holding all our eggs and then trying to capitalize on it the next day. Uh, it is, they thought about it for a little while, and then they thought about it for a little while, and then they thought about it for a little while. <laughs> they, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the series stayed dormant for a, a bit of time, and that is where the David Gordon Green thing comes up in 2016. That's where Blumhouse gets the rights. John Carpenter gets involved for the first time since two. And that really injects this thing with a whole new sense of energy. And that's where I was excited getting filmmakers like David Gordon yeah. Green and his uh, cohorts on. That's a completely out of left field, different choice for talent for this, uh, for this franchise. And I thought if anybody's going to understand everything I explained earlier about what the horror of Halloween really is pulling on and what Michael Myers really is at the end of that first movie standalone. Yeah. David Gordon Green is going to understand that. Halloween 18 comes out huge, huge, huge. Um, and this is the third film just called Halloween, by the way, <laughs> for all those tracking oh along at home. Incredible, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> but it's but it takes place after the first one titled Halloween, but ignores the second. It's in it's, this. So you gotta, if you yeah, watch yeah. these movies now, you'll you'll watch Halloween and then Halloween. you watch Halloween and then yeah. you watch Halloween. Kills, kills and then but this is a trilogy yeah yeah it's <laughs> there's two elements so uh for the first time i was feeling like i was seeing the actual character arise on screen in halloween kills i think halloween kills is all about michael and it's all about putting the boogeyman back in his haunted house the myers house has been absent from these movies for as, as god i mean forever <laughs> Um, and four and five don't even try to pretend like it's the same house. And then it, they've just been gone, no, not mentioned at all. And that was one of my biggest things with Halloween 2018 is that Myers house is not mentioned. And for me, that is uh, the that's the only thing. The only thing in Michael's motivation is that house and being in that house. <laughs> and it's been absent. And without that, it's kind of like taking, you know, Candyman out of Caprini Green. Uh, yeah. It's it's very much like that to me. So you take michael out of his haunted house if that's not part of his motivation in some way mm, i don't know what we're getting to so howling kills yeah. a very very polarizing film it, there's a, something like a 31 body count on it it's in, it's crazy but finally a filmmaker was coming all the way back around to talking about the elements of horror that i was wanting to talk about and i was shocked it was finally happening <laughs> um and so that's where it brings us into ends because it left on a cliffhanger, and now we're going to close out the series, and now we have a Halloween movie that says ends, and you now we can point to a period somewhere on this crazy infographic chart we're looking at. <laughs> or at least for Jamie Lee Curtis or at something. At least for know, Jamie Lee, hopefully, you know, like, uh, so I'm super excited. We're getting some really interesting stabs. <laughs> stabs. Uh, we're getting some really interesting takes on on what this material can be and and some recalibration of, I think, what this material is and has always been and what it's supposed to be about. And that's where I think Kills is really misunderstood. I think inside that movie is 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 telling you exactly what I was trying to, you know, uh, you know at an arm's distance say earlier about what the horror is of Halloween. Yeah. Um, well, it's also like what we talked about last week with Lord of the Rings and then you had mentioned Star Wars and now – on illiterate we're talking yes, about not yes. just things based on things but things based on themselves <laughs> and at a certain point you do have to say well what was it saying in 78 that then influenced everything else and then scream is making a commentary on right. it and we've talked about right. a new scream which right. is based on halloween which is based on something else so you right kind of have to say <laughs> this isn't going to be what you thought it was or remember it as but you have to take it you know, if you want to still use the same thing with a new coat of paint and not just do the same thing over and over again, you have to do something a little bit right. differently. And again, this, like we said with Lord of the Rings, they're going to do this again. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because I had seen kind of gravy, ain't it? <laughs> I guess I guess Jamie Lee Curtis was saying, which I don't know if this is like true legalese, but something in the franchise contracts or something that Mustafa had put where you can't actually kill michael myers yeah actually really. she, th she threatened to walk off halloween h2o because of it for real 
she was sold the idea that this is going to be the last one. She full on pulled the production to a halt and threatened to walk if the impression to the audience when the movie was over yeah. was not that Michael Myers is dead. Uh, and I'm so happy she did because, <laughs> because <laughs> that's, that, that would not, again, that just would have been, that would have been so cheap. And we saw all of that borne out in Halloween Resurrection. Halloween, <laughs> Surprise, about Halloween yeah. Resurrection, yeah, so yeah. It would have been, it would have ruined it. <laughs> So, but does the uh, not dead clause still stand with this one? Who knows? I don't. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. I think. I think since he died, I don't think that's actually a thing. Yeah, it could still be real. I don't know. But again, <laughs> I don't think they're gonna kill Michael. I don't know what they're gonna do. I'm so excited. I don't know what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen? If people are saying it's polarizing. People are saying that it is gonna make you angry. And I'm like, this is gonna be great. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah, I've uh, been like, angry what, before. Yeah. Again, like what I said with uh with Lord of the Rings, you know, it's all gravy at this point. People are going we're gonna be remaking. This is one of those things. We're going to take more shots at this thing down the down the line. So we might as well just take them for what they are, take the parts you like, push away the parts you don't, and then just yeah. enjoy it. It's all just candy. It's all fun. This ain't no again. Let's remember Halloween was nobody's passion project, and let's just enjoy it for everything that it inspired. It, that it inspired. Oh my gosh, <laughs> thirteen yeah. films, uh, tons a, of a, tons of uh, filmmakers who wanted to do horror stuff because of it. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I. It's one of my favorite things, and I'm, I'm trying to look at it with candy, uh, with candy eyes, and just it's all gravy <laughs> and. You know, I hope that they keep making good decisions because I think they made some great decisions. Uh, we'll see what I think after, you know, call me up tonight, Taylor, and let me yeah, yeah. tell you my thoughts after I see this one. But, you know, yeah. I, I can't wait until they do the new one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in line already. I'm in line for the next one. Anyway, this has been a blast. Thank you, Taylor. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you guys for uh, sticking with us. If you've listened to us this long, really, thank you. It's uh, it's been an incredible ride. Uh, And so reach out to us at Illiterate Pod, uh, at Instagram. Let us know what you're reading. Let us know what you're watching. What shows are you excited for coming out? Get in touch with us. You never know when we'll do an episode about that thing you want to know all about. Until next Friday, everybody. Stay safe.